All right, guys, we're gonna start in just a moment. All right, everybody, uh, welcome to our Common Butterflies and Host Plants webinar. Uh, thank you for your patience. If you've been waiting for just a second while I got uh, all the technical side of things figured out. My name is Rachel Felling. I'm a naturalist with the Zionsville Nature Center, part of the Zionsville Parks and Recreation Department. Um, and we're here for Common Butterflies and their host plants. And we're gonna have a lot of fun talking about these guys today. Um, couple bits of housekeeping as I get started. Uh, you, This meeting is on both Zoom and being live streamed on Facebook. So whether you're watching on Zoom or Facebook, if you have questions, please put them in the, in the chat on Zoom, in the comments on Facebook, um, and I will do my best to get them answered either as we go or as soon as we wrap up. It's hard to click between the two screens, uh, but we'll do that. And uh, yeah, I, I have everybody muted, cameras off for those of you who are on Zoom, um, and I'm going to keep it that way throughout um, just because we are recording this. So if you have questions, utilize the chat feature, please. Um, so June is the uh, National Pollinator Month. So here we are, June 1st. I don't know how it's June already, but somehow it is. And we are kicking it off by talking about common butterflies and their host plants. So everybody loves butterflies. They are gorgeous. They are a sign of summer. They're like little works of art in the air. I love them. I think they're incredible. And a lot of people often ask us, you know, how do we encourage more butterflies in our yard? How do we get more in our area? Um, and so often we talk about pollinator plants, but today we're going to talk about host plants and we'll talk about what the difference is in here in just a moment. So the way this, this program is going to work is I'm going to go through um, a little bit about what host plants are, what they aren't, some things you need to consider if you're going to think about planting any of these at your own home, and then some actual butterflies that you may or may not see. Um, some are really common, some are a little less common, but if you plant the right things, they will come. Um, and then what to plant, and then we're going to wrap up with how. How do you get these plants? Because not all of them are the easiest things to find, unfortunately. Um, so that's what we're gonna get into today. Throw the questions in the comments or the chat and I will get to them as I can. So let's start here. What is a host plant? Um, a host plant is something that a butterfly can lay their eggs on and then the caterpillars are going to consume it, okay? so. Think of like a mammal, like a raccoon or a fox or a deer, or even a bird, you know, that have their babies. The, the parents come back and they feed, okay? These insects are not gonna do that. The, the butterflies are not coming back to feed their babies once they hatch. They lay their eggs where the food is. That is their goal. They want those eggs to hatch and ready-made meals right there um, for them. So very different than how mammals do it, very different than how birds do it, but this is how these butterflies do it. And some butterflies have very, very specific plants that they need to lay their eggs on. And we're gonna talk about that. Some can do any plant within a large family of plants, right? Like one large group of plants and there's lots of different species. So there's some of those. And then there are some more generalists who might have five, 10, 15 different kinds of plants that they can host on. but it changes depending on what species of butterfly you're talking about. Also worth noting, we're focusing on butterflies today, but moths are in that same category. They are also doing the same thing. So um, <clears throat> that's, that's what we're gonna talk about. They, these plants may or may not be nectar plants as well. So often when we talk about butterflies and attracting butterflies to gardens, people will focus on the nectar plants. Now these are the flowers that are gonna um, bloom on a plant that have lots of nectar in them. So butterflies love to visit them. And some of the plants can have that as well, some of these host plants, but not all of them. And while it's great to have the nectar for butterflies to drink from in their adult stage, providing the host plant, that habitat and food source for the caterpillars, 
is huge because you're not just giving it food, you are giving it a place to continue the population. So that's a really important thing to consider and a really great asset to add to your garden. Um, so these host plants are gonna be native to the same area as the butterflies that they host. And that's also important. A lot of the nectar plants that you may see at like a big box garden store might have good nectar potentially, but they're gonna be worthless as a host plant because many of them aren't even native to our area, which is a really unfortunate thing about how the um, horticulture industry has trended in recent years that usually the plants that you can go buy to per plant at your home are not actually plants from here in large part. Um, so we're gonna talk about native plants and where to get them at the end, okay? And I said this already, but some butterflies have really specific host plants. Some can have some variety. Um, and many of these host plants are, are hosts for multiple species. And that's a really good thing. So you're going to see as we go through some of the same plants coming up over and over again. And host plants can be grasses, they could be vines, they can be bushes, they could be shrubs, they could be wildflowers, they can be trees. So we're talking anything from something small you're going to put in your garden, maybe a vine that you want over sort of a trellis area in a garden, to, you know, a bush to put in front of your house, to the trees to plant along your backyard. So does not matter what kind of area you're working with, you can find some sort of host plant to put there to attract butterflies and make your home a better habitat for all sorts of creatures. Um, so, and then finally, and this is a tough one, some of these plants that I'm gonna talk about, these host plants for butterflies and moths, might be something you consider a weed. So I think it's worth taking a moment to define what is a weed. Um, because a lot of people, you know, they get it in their head that this is one, it's a weed, it shouldn't be here. But a weed is just, it's a very subjective term. It is a plant that you don't want growing somewhere, okay? There are plenty of native wildlife beneficial, amazing plants that a lot of people might consider a weed because they don't want it, okay? And those of us who are trying to create more natural habitats, might look at something that someone else planted in their garden that they thought was beautiful and cultivated, but it spreads as a weed. So it's a weed is not a scientific term. It is a subjective term. So um, in fact, the first plant we're gonna talk about in a couple slides has the word weed in its name because it's something usually weeds, weeds grow quickly, okay? They grow fast, they can spread. And that's why they get the name weed right? Um, a lot of people consider a dandelion a weed. Dandelions have a lot of wildlife beneficial um, properties and a lot of wildlife really rely on them and think they're great. But if you are a person who just wanted a perfectly manicured yard, you may not want those dandelions. Um, subjective depending on your goals. So worth talking about. And again, if at any point you've got questions, put them in the chat. I will do my best to keep an eye on them. Um, sometimes when I'm sharing a screen, it can be hard to see the chat. Um, and we'll keep going. Other things to keep in mind as you are deciding what plants to put in, I'm assuming that if you're sitting in on this webinar or watching this on Facebook Live, it's because you are interested in planting some of these things. So just like any plants, Things like your soil type, your hardiness zone are things to keep in mind. Um, everything that I'm gonna to talk to you about today in terms of hardiness zone here in central Indiana would be appropriate. But when you, if you start just Googling specific host plants for butterflies, you may get resources from down South in the Southern United States or Southeastern United States. And obviously different hardiness zones, different growth of, of different kind of, of plants. Um, look for native plants when possible and avoid cultivars if you can. So what's a cultivar? It is when you take a species of plant and you cultivate it in a certain way. Usually this is done to bring out um, some certain attribute about the plant, right? You've got now variegated leaves that pop in a different color or um, the flowers are a different variety of color or size. And in some cases, cultivars can still provide good host sites for butterflies. In some cases, they can't. So if your goal is butterfly host plants and not the look of the plant so much, then go with as close to the native species as possible and avoid the cultivars. Now, that's not always possible. Sometimes the cultivars are just what's readily available. Um, 
So, but it's, it's just a little caveat to throw out there. If you can get the native species, go for that. Um, as with any other plant, think about your sun, your shade. We're gonna talk about a little bit of both today. Um, I've got some plants that we're gonna bring up that are full sun, some that are full shade, uh, some in between. We're gonna talk about little tiny things on the ground to giant trees, so a lot of variety. Um, and we're gonna to touch on all these things, but then you know, if there are certain ones that sort of spark to you, um, you're gonna go ahead and do a deep dive. And then last but not least, a lot of plants don't flower in the first year. So even um, things like common and milkweed will not flower their first year. And so some people get disappointed, but keep in mind flowering does not determine whether or not a butterfly can lay its eggs on it, okay? It will help it be a good nectar source if it's something that has flowers that butterflies come to. Um, so whether your goal is host plants, nectar, or both, just don't get discouraged if you don't see flowers in the first year for a lot of our native wildflower plants. Not all of them flower the first year. Some of them take those two cycles to get there, okay? Um, and what we're gonna do now is we're gonna jump into the actual species of butterflies. Um, this is sort of a chicken and an, or the egg situation. Do we talk about the plants in which butterflies host on them or talk about the butterflies and which plants they host on? So I went with butterflies and their plants that they host on, but you could do it either way. It just sort of depends on their goals. But we're gonna look at 16 different species of butterfly. We're gonna look at the adult butterfly, we're gonna look at the caterpillar because if you're planting a host plant, that's what you should also be able to find. Some of them, some of them are tiny and it'll be hard to find, but on a lot of them, you could be able to find the caterpillars. And then we're gonna talk about the plants, whether it's just one specific species or here's a couple. Um, and when you start doing a deep dive into some of these, you may see some plants that are not native to Indiana that come up on the list of host plants. With the exception of a couple, I tried to only include native plants on this list for our purposes today. Does not mean that you're not gonna find more if you do some more research on them though. So this list may not be all inclusive is the caveat I'm going to give you there. All right, so let's dive into our first butterfly. I hope this is one that everybody who's watching has um, seen at some point, knows at, at least a little bit about we are gonna talk about the monarchs. Um, monarch butterflies, I think are one species that we've actually done a really good public education campaign on in the last decade or two. Um, they are so unique. They are a specialist that needs just that one kind of plant or can only use that one kind of plant to host on. And uh, you know, I find that even young kids know about butterflies and they know about their host plant milkweed. So the butterfly, the monarch is this iconic, beautiful orange and black butterfly. Um, you can see the caterpillar in the middle picture there. They are black, yellow, white. They can get quite large. Um, I'd say maybe about three inches when they're full grown. Um, caterpillars go through something called instars. So, you know, when we see the big fat caterpillar, well, they didn't hatch out of a tiny egg like that. They start tiny and then they grow and they go through a process called instars, which involves molting as they grow. And most species in their caterpillar or larval stage will go through that a couple instars before they go to the pupa stage, which is their, where they form their chrysalis and turn into the adult worm butterfly, okay? so. As they go through the different instars, they may look different at different stages. It, it sometimes is just smaller to larger. Sometimes they actually do change quite a bit, but we're gonna look at some of the most common older instars because that's what you're most likely to see when you know this monarch butterfly is an eighth of an inch long. It's less likely that you're gonna find it crawling on your milkweed unless you're out there looking at it. But sometimes these big fatty caterpillars, when they're a couple inches long, you can't miss them. And we're, there's a couple of species that we're gonna talk about as we go that are really fun to find because they look really interesting. Um, so the monarchs, like I said, are specialists. They have to have that milkweed. They cannot lay their eggs on any other species. Monarchs are not the only thing that uses milkweed as a host plant. There is called the, there's a moth called the milkweed tussock moth that also lays its eggs on milkweed. Um, and they have a very furry caterpillar that you may find if you have some milkweed planted outside your house. And there's different species of milkweed too. Um, 
for most of these host plants, I'm not going to go through the specific species of the different kinds of host plants um, because we'd be here all day. But for milkweed, just briefly, since this is one of the more common ones and it's becoming more readily available, even at your big box style stores, um, we'll just talk about it briefly. So the adult butterfly you see in the picture on those purplish pink flowers is on what we call common milkweed. That's also what the caterpillar in the picture is eating. Common milkweed can grow very, very tall, like four or five feet tall. It has big, broad leaves. It needs good full sunlight. And if it's got that sunlight, you can grow it in just about anywhere. It'll grow in even pretty degraded soils. Um, that's why you see it on roadsides, the edges of farm fields but it's a great plant. It's also a great nectar plant for lots and lots of things. You will go look at milkweed when it's flowering in the middle of summer like this, you will see not just butterflies, but bees, moths, all sorts of things buzzing around it. They love it. Um, so common milkweed, you can easily grow as long as you've got full sun. Um, some homeowners don't love it because it's so big and tall and it will spread and it will take over an area. So if you have that happening, just cut it back. If you're looking for some smaller species, you know, you want to support monarchs, you want to have that host plant, but maybe you don't have quite the room for a huge patch of milkweed. Um, butterfly milkweed, which is what you see with the orange flowers in the other picture, is a species with a smaller, more narrow leaf, does not grow as tall, probably two to three feet ish. Um, and it provides the same hosting plant. The leaves are a little smaller, so if you get many, um, excuse me, adults laying their eggs, they will go through those leaves faster, but it flowers. It's a good nectar plant as well. And then there's also swamp milkweed, um, which as the name would suggest, grows in wet areas. It can get its feet really wet. So it can be a good one if that is something you are dealing with in an area around your home or your garden. You want something that could grow in a wet space, swamp milkweed, it could be a good solution. I've even had swamp milkweed grow for me personally in areas without full sun. Um, so that is definitely a plus for it. Uh, you'll also see tropical milkweed and it is discouraged as a milkweed species if you can pick a different one. Um, there's some different and sometimes conflicting data out there, but the idea of tropical milkweed is as you, the name suggests, grows more readily in the tropical areas and it flowers later. And some research shows that there's a possibility that it may discourage monarchs from migrating in the fall because they still will have plenty of nectar source. Um, so if you have the options for the other ones, go for the other ones. Okay, let's get into another species of butterfly. Here is, we, so we went here, the monarch, very common. Everybody knows this one. I'm going to show you one that you don't know. Um, and I know the title of this webinar is Common Butterflies and Their Host Plants, but I want to show you one incredibly uncommon one. In fact, this is a species of butterfly that is threatened or endangered in just about every area of its range. And it is the Baltimore checker spot, sometimes known as the Bay checker spot. Um, we're going to see another species of checker spot here in a minute. Um, these guys, their host plant primarily is the white turtle head. There is some evidence that there are a few others that they could use, but the white turtle head, which you see pictured here, is their preferred host plant. Um, these plants grow natively in wetland areas. So over the decades, as wetlands have been drained and removed, they have lost habitat. Um, the Baltimore checker spot is incredibly rare, but it is one that you know is worth trying to bring back. And so if you can find white turtle heads and plant them, especially again, if you've got a wet area, and you know, I think for most of us, if you've got an area in your yard or garden where you're getting water collecting, Usually we don't want that. So planting some plants that can help soak that up and help you manage that naturally is a great solution to that problem. And white turtle heads, you know, not only are they the host plant of this, they're a good nectar plant. They're gorgeous. I mean, those flowers, the picture doesn't do this justice. Um, 
and the Baltimore checker spot is just, it's a beautiful butterfly, um, kind of a ferocious looking caterpillar. And you'll see a list with some of the caterpillars, right? They've got these little spikes and things on them. Some of them actually could be poisonous if you touch them too much with our own human hands. Um, it's more to keep animals from eating it. Um, and it's a defense mechanism. It's a tiny little creature that is, it cannot bite, it cannot fly away, it can't run away very fast, so it's got to come up with these other ways of not getting eaten, and we're going to see some fun adaptations on our caterpillars as we go through, but um, there's been, especially out east, on the east coast of the United States, um, some big pushes to get people to put you know, white turtle heads in their gardens at home to try to bring back the Baltimore trekker spot population. So as we talk about all these common ones, I think it's worth also noting that, you know, we can always make a push to help these threatened and endangered species as well. So let's look at another checker spot here. There we go. Here is the silvery checker spot. Now this is one that you likely have seen around your home, flying around. Um, I see these guys at this time of year, um, they're fun to watch. This is a silvery checker spot. So you can see they're not, they're not very big. Um, it's, you know, an inch to two inches across. Uh, the caterpillar is right there. Similar in shape and uh, size and uh, body type, we'll say, as the Baltimore checker spot that we looked at with those little spikes up its back to try to make it look scary. Don't want to eat it, right? You don't want to eat something that looks spiky and it's got warning colors on it. Um, but the silvery checker spot will lay their eggs on a few different things and things that are easy to grow, full sunlight. That's part of why these guys are more common. Um, Black-eyed Susans, Rudebeckias. So that's what this picture is right here, Black-eyed Susans. Um, I have heard people refer to Black-eyed Susans as a weed. Again, like I said at the beginning, weed is a subjective term. They will spread. If you get a Black-eyed Susans in a good spot, they will spread out. So you may need to thin them occasionally. Um, sunflowers. Will also can also be a host for the silvery checker spot and then purple cone flowers and i've actually seen several seed mixes that include black eyed susans and purple cone flowers in the same thing um, the cone flowers are going to be a little taller the uh, black eyed susans shorter um, but they're oh absolutely gorgeous um, good plants for both nectar and then um, wildlife birds and stuff will eat the seeds out of all of these so Definitely some great plants to get grown in your garden to attract the silvery checker spot, as well as other animals. Really high quality wildlife plants right there. All right, let's take a look at this next one, the morning cloak. I've got a special place in my heart for morning cloaks. They're one of the very earliest butterflies that emerges in the spring. Um, you see these guys sometime in April. They're one of the first ones that come out and they're big, they're large. We're talking, you know, three to four inches across. Um, absolutely gorgeous butterfly. Their colors are a little more subtle than some others, but man, they are beautiful. And then <laughs> their, their caterpillar is pretty ferocious. Take a look at him. The, so we use the term warning colors in ecology to talk about things that have these bright colors that are saying, do not eat me, right? They're not trying to camouflage. They're trying to do the opposite. They're saying, uh-uh, you don't want to eat me because generally they contain some sort of toxin that would make an animal sick. Um, occasionally the warning colors are actually just a, you know, a bit of a smoke screen. They're not real, um, but it's a, it's a way to keep things from eating it. So that's what this, this caterpillar is doing. It's got the warning colors, it's got the big spikes. Most things aren't going to eat it or they're going to eat it when it's pretty small. Um, so morning cloaks are one that is going to lay their eggs, not on little flowers or some, you know, small shrub, but on trees. So morning cloaks will host on willow trees and all varieties of willow. So you might have a black willow, um, a weeping willow, elm trees, and there's a couple different kinds of elms you may have, cottonwoods, and then hackberries. So I included the picture of the hackberry bark in this picture. I, you can see some leaves as well. Um, because out of all of these, I feel like hackberry is probably the least well known for a lot of people. Um, some people don't like hackberry, right? Um, I think hackberry is a really nice tree. And a really easy distinguishing feature of a hackberry is that bark. You can see the deep ridges on the bark, even in this picture. But if you like went and pushed your fingernail in it, it's soft. It's like cork is what I would compare it to, like a cork on a wine bottle or a cork board. Um, a very similar type soft 
texture. So that's um, pretty distinctive. So, you know, again, if you're looking for trees, go for trees that are gonna have some wildlife benefits as well. All right. So we've seen a few beautiful, colorful butterflies. Let's talk about some of the more subtle ones, right? There's a lot of beautiful butterflies out there, but these subtle butterflies, they are beautiful in their own right. They don't have to have big bright colors to be beautiful. Um, and this is one of them that I think is cool. This is the Columbine Dusky Wing. And there's a few different kinds of dusky wings out there. Um, I decided to focus on the Columbine because of its host plant. Um, it's a smaller butterfly, inch and a half, less than two inches. Um, you know, wing, when I talk about size of the butterfly, I'm talking about the wingspan when they have their wings out. Um, tiny little bitty caterpillar right there. It's on a columbine leaf. So, and as its name suggests, its host plant is wild columbine. So this is more of a, a specialist butterfly. It's not gonna lay its eggs on 10 different kinds of plants. It's looking for columbine. Um, and this picture, gosh, if you don't have any columbine in your garden and you're trying to add some beautiful natives, you cannot go wrong with columbine. It's gorgeous, beautiful leaf shape, um, these beautiful red delicate flowers that drape down just like in that picture. It can grow fairly tall um, and it'll spread. I have some growing out front of my house right now. It did not flower last year. Last year was its first year of planting, but I can already see it getting ready to flower this year. And it's, I'd say probably about three feet tall. Um, you can get this to grow in garden beds and in low sunlight. So it's an understory flower, a wildlife or a wildflower that would grow, you know, without tons of sunlight. Um, and it's just, it's a really nice plant, something really beautiful to put out in a flower garden out front if you're trying to shift your focus towards natives. And then you can host the Columbine Dusky Wing. Beautiful little butterfly, very subtle. All right, let's go for a more showy butterfly now. This is the common buckeye. So a slightly smaller, a couple inches across. Um, the common buckeye I think is really beautiful. Um, it's got those eye spots on it and the idea of those, those big circles on its wings, we call them eye spots because it's a defense mechanism, right? It helps them look like, oh, you don't want to eat me. Look, I'm like a bird or a snake or something, right? Like the idea is that an animal that might try to eat that will see those spots and think, oh, that's some bigger animal's eyes. Um, that is the, you know, type of camouflage that this thing's going for. Really cute butterfly, you know, even with the blacks, browns, whites, um, those colors, more natural colors, still very, very beautiful. Um, a ferocious looking caterpillar. Look at those big old spikes all over it. This guy is small, but definitely looks pretty intimidating. And the common buckeye has a few different host plants, um, wild petunias, which is what is this picture is. So petunia might be something you think of as what you'd put in your garden. Um, most of the petunia that you'll see found at a garden center is not the wild variety. It's not a native variety. So it's not gonna help our common buckeye as a host plant. But if you can get wild petunia, it will, and it's gorgeous. And it's the other differences, it's gonna come back year after year. It, you know, it's not something you're going to have to plant every single year. If you get it established, it'll come back. Um, snapdragons, and there are native and non-native varieties of this. There are some that you plant from seeds, some that you can buy at garden centers, um, but it will host on those as well. And then the land-sleeved coreopsis, um, also known as tick seed, pretty yellow flowers, these grow you know, natively, and if you usually if you don't mow your yard fast enough, um, especially if you have some woods nearby or, or other natural area, you'll get some coreopsis popping up. Um, but it is another one that it uh, it will host on, and it's called tick seed because it has lots of little seeds, not because there are ticks on it. So I think it's one of those plants that people avoid because of the name, but it's a bit of a misnomer. That's the common buckeye, beautiful little butterfly. All right, the painted lady or an American lady as they're sometimes called. If you have raised butterflies from like a kit, it was probably 
like a painted lady. Um, beautiful butterfly. They're little, I'd say under two inches. Um, some similar coloring as a monarch. You've got that orange, black, and white. I've even had kids call these a monarch. They're not a monarch. This is a painted lady. Very pretty. Um, their, their caterpillars are small, but again, lots of pokey ones. We're going to look at some smooth ones here in a little bit. Don't worry. Um, and they have several host plants um, and more than what I have listed here. Um, and that's part of why that they are so often in those kits that you can get to raise butterflies at home because you can feed them with lots and lots of different things. Um, but in the wild, different types of thistles, they will lay their eggs on. Rose mallow, which is a really pretty plant and one that grows well in a wet area. It's a, it's a, a shrub more than like a flower. Um, so if, again, if you've got a wet area, that might be one to consider. Asters, and there's lots of different kinds of asters out there. And then the picture that I included here, the ironweed. I love, love, love the purple flowers on ironweed. Um, a really nice um, pollinator plant. They do grow tall. So, you know, that's always something to consider when you're figuring out what to plant and where to plant it. But ironweed is a really good option. I love ironweed. It will, you know, weed is in the name, meaning it will grow fast and spread usually. Um, something that some people are going to consider a weed, right? Subjective. They don't want it, but I would welcome it into my garden because it is very wildlife beneficial. The red spotted purple, probably my favorite named butterfly, the red spotted purple. It's a great one. And you know what I think is funny about it? Is it's not that purple to me. <laughs> a lot of times when you get, you know, whether it's a bird or a butterfly or whatever it is, when you get a close up look, you're like, oh, I can see where the name comes from. This one, I'm always like, mm, I don't know. I don't quite see the purple. I see black, I see blue, and I see orange. Um, but this is the red spotted purple. Um, these are really common throughout the woods in this area in central Indiana. Um, in the summertime, you'll see them a lot, even into the fall. Um, the Let's take a look at the caterpillar here. Take a minute to look at that weird looking caterpillar in the bottom left of the screen. The caterpillar is trying to camouflage by looking like something. What is it trying to look like? Bird poop. And we'll see this again with a couple others that we're going to see in a bit. It is trying to look like bird poop. That is how it has evolved to not get eaten by birds is by looking like bird poop. Um, really great mimicry. It looks awesome, um, but that's what it looks like. And this is another, like we talked about the morning cloak earlier, that hosts on trees. Our red spotted purple hosts on trees as well, which is why you'll see these in forests or along edges of forests frequently. Um, the red spotted purple will use cottonwood, which we've seen before, willow, which we've seen before, cherry, we've seen that as well, and black oak. So I included the picture here of our cherry tree, our native wild cherry. Um, <clears throat> cherries have beautiful flowers um, that are very pollinator friendly. They produce berries that a lot of things eat. They are not the type of cherries that we generally eat. Um, they would not be, they would not taste like a grocery store cherry. Um, that is not the kind of cherry tree that grows here. Um, they have nice hardwood. Um, they are a slow growing tree and don't generally get huge. So something to consider if you're looking for a smaller tree and a part of your yard, a cherry is a really good option, especially if you want something that's going to be sort of a medium sized tree. They're never going to be massive like an oak or a walnut um, and, and can be a great host plant, not just for this, but for other things as well. All right. The great spangled fritillary. What a beautiful formal name for this butterfly. These guys are really pretty. Another one that sometimes I've had kids confuse for a monarch. Um, they are orange. It is feeding right there in that picture on milkweed flowers, the butterfly milkweed. Um, great nectar plant, um, but they're smaller than a monarch. They're again about two inches across. They're one of those like medium-sized butterflies, you know, not too giant. Um, spiky little caterpillar there, mostly black with the orange picture, or orange um, spots on it. And these guys, their host plant is violets. 
And there's a few different species of violets that we find here in central Indiana natively, the common blue violet being the most common as it's in its name. And I wanted to make sure that I included this one, um, not because it's the most common butterfly that you're gonna see everywhere, if they are fairly common, but because violet is also, not, a, not only is it a host plant here, but it's a great ground cover and it's beautiful. So a lot of people have sort of gotten, you know, the point that, the big giant grass manicured lawn that Americans have been taught for decades that we should all desire generally doesn't have a lot of wildlife benefit and it can kind of be a pain to maintain. Violet can be a really good ground cover that is a grass alternative, especially in the shade. They grow in the understory of the forest on the ground. They're pretty easy to get growing and then they will spread. I have a ton of violets at my house in our woods around it and kind of on the edges where we are transitioning from the grass into the woods. Um, and I will mow it at along the edges there and it keeps coming back. So violet is an awesome ground cover, especially if you have shade, um, a really good thing to consider, good wildlife benefits. You know, a lot of po pollinators love violets. They flower early too. So they're one of the first flowers to really get going in the spring. So I would highly encourage you to consider adding some violets to your yard and they're among the easier things to grow. All right, so we are going to keep going here and get into the many species of swallowtail, lots and lots of kinds of swallowtail. Um, and we're gonna start with what I would say is likely the most common around here. I saw one just this morning, yesterday, sometime very in the last 24 hours an Eastern tiger swallowtail. There is a Western variety of this as well. Um, the tiger swallowtail gets its name from the black and yellow on its body, beautiful tiger stripes on it. It's a gorgeous butterfly. Um, and it's, um, you can see it's caterpillar. This is a caterpillar that as the, it goes through its instars, its appearance changes a little bit. So this is one of the later instars. It will get a darker color. Um, I love finding these with kids because it's like a cartoon character, right? It's got those spots on that caterpillar that are meant to look like eye spots. The idea of this caterpillar's camouflage is that it looks like a snake. That's what it's trying to look like. To me, whether or not it's actually achieving that is debatable, <laughs> but that's what it's going for. Um, and they will get a little darker right before they're about to make their chrysalis and pupate, um, but really fun looking little guy. I think it's so cute. They're really cool to find. A little bit of blue on them as well. Um, and then the adult, the, that blue stripe kind of along the bottom um, is how you tell it's male versus the female is all yellow there. Um, and they host on multiple kinds of trees. So tulip trees, the state tree of Indiana is a good one for our tiger swallowtail. Cherry tree, we just talked about that one. Choke cherry, which is what in this, what's in this picture here, um, a smaller variety of, of tree. So this would be a small tree. So another one to look for. Um, I've recently found a few of these in the woods behind my own house that I was not, I didn't realize that we had. Um, so choke cherry is what I put here, a, a really cool one to look for. And then willow, again, another type of tree that we've talked about more than once here. Um, you can see it uh, getting some nectar on a flower. So love Eastern tiger swallowtails, they are beautiful. Let's look at another swallowtail, the black swallowtail. And I think swallowtails can get a little confusing sometimes. They all have the name swallowtail, excuse me, because of those little tails on the bottom parts of its wings, um, sometimes called a little club, um, just like an elongated thing in the bottom and they're all in the same family. So the black swallowtail is mostly black, but with a yellow stripe. So if I flip back real quick to our tiger and then over to the black, Similar body size shape, the swallowtails are all, with the exception of one that we'll talk about in a minute, a, a larger butterfly, right? They are your three, four inch across butterflies, um, has that swallow pattern. It's mostly black with this yellow stripe. We're gonna see another one in a little bit that I, to me, should have been called the black swallowtail over this one, um, but it is not. The black swallowtail's caterpillar is often confused with the monarchs. 
So it's got a similar size, shape, and pattern, but it's different colors. So the monarch caterpillar is black, yellow, white. This guy is green, black, and yellow. Um, but you can see why they could occasionally be confused. Black swallowtails will host on a variety of things. They love Queen Anne's lace, um, which is a native wildflower that you'll see growing along roadsides and stuff like that. Um, and in the family, same family of Queen Anne's lace, you get your carrots, your parsley, and your dill. So this is a common one that pops up in people's gardens, not a flower garden, but like a vegetable or herb garden. And I included those, um, even though, you know, obviously not necessarily native, there are wild carrots and wild parsnips and things like that that are, um, but there are things that you can plant easily that you might already be planting if you've got a vegetable garden that you can use for black swallowtails. I know people who raise things like dill and parsley specifically for these butterflies, not because they're going to eat them. So um, they will eat up your herbs if they get in there, but I always see that as a plus because you're, you know, providing food and wildlife for something else. Um, and then what's in the picture there, these yellow flowers are what are golden Alexanders, which are really pretty wildflowers. So if you are going less for the um, herb <laughs> vibe and more for the wildflowers, the golden Alexanders are a good choice. So that's a black swallowtail. Let's take a look at a less common, but oh my goodness, so beautiful zebra swallowtail. Um, I don't see zebra swallowtails all the time. I usually see a few every summer. They are not the most common, but they will be in woodlands. And oh my gosh, long, long tails on the zebra swallowtail. You can see where its name comes from with those black and white stripes, so vibrant. And then the little patch of red, um, absolutely gorgeous butterfly, quite possibly my favorite, prettiest in my opinion, butterfly. Um, Funky caterpillar, very fat guy, um, and with some stripes on it, interesting shape. But their host plant is my favorite tree in Indiana, the pawpaw tree, nicknamed the Indiana banana. So a pawpaw is a native tree and fruit, but it is a tropical-like fruit. If you've never tasted a pawpaw, so the, the fruits that you see in this picture um, will show up on the tree late summer, early fall. So we're talking like September-ish. You might see a pawpaw if you're lucky. Wildlife love them. They're delicious, very sugary, good, um, good healthy sugar in them for animals that are trying to fatten up for the winter. Um, the pawpaw, if you were to cut into that fruit, it's going to have a orangey kind of middle and it's I always describe the taste of it it is completely edible for us the fruit um the the meat of the fruit I believe the seeds are potentially toxic but they're big seeds um the it is somewhere between a mango and a banana like it does not taste like anything that should be growing on a tree in Indiana to me it tastes like something that you would get you know in Mexico or Costa Rica or something but it is a native fruit um the trees are I'd say sort of a medium-sized tree. They're usually not massive, like an oak or a walnut or a maple, more of that middle size, kind of like the cherry trees that we had talked about earlier. They have these huge broad leaves. Um, this time of year, late spring, early summer, they have these really fun, beautiful purplish flowers on them. Um, I just saw some here at Starkey Park in Zionsville last week that were huge and beautiful. Um, so that is the pawpaw tree host plant for a zebra swallowtail. So you can see even these swallowtails, right? This is our third swallowtail, I believe that we've talked about. All the same family of butterfly, but they're all using all these different host plants because they've evolved and adapted to specialize on these different ones. So zebra swallowtail, plant yourself a pawpaw tree. You won't be sorry for lots of reasons. Um, pawpaw tree's nickname is the Indiana banana. Pipe vine swallowtail. Here's a less common swallowtail, but still really, really incredible. Um, these guys, smaller tail, beautiful color, sort of a blue with orange and black. Um, they're a little smaller than some of these other ones. And look at that caterpillar. That guy is definitely giving off some warnings of saying, do not eat me. It is going to be a bad idea. You don't want to do it. Um, and as its name suggests, it hosts some pipe vine, 
Um, and there are a lot of varieties of pipe vine out there. There are native varieties. Um, pipe vine, if you've got trellis or you're trying to grow something along the fence, could be a good option. But it is one that can get, it, it can grow fast and wide and be difficult to, um, you know, control depending on where you want it. So that's just something to consider. Um, we'll also host on wild snake root. And then what I have in the picture here is wild ginger. So like the um, picture I showed earlier of the violets, wild ginger is a, actually fairly easy to cultivate. Great ground cover in a shady area. So this picture's got a patch of it in what I think is a rock garden. Um, so if you're looking for something to fill in a shady area, wild ginger is a really good option. I have some growing along the side of my house in a little area that doesn't get any sun. It's hard to grow anything there, but I don't want just the exposed dirt. Um, so wild ginger is a great option, and you're potentially hosting your pipe vine swallowtail, which is a beautiful butterfly. So, um, and it is related to the ginger that we use, we eat. Um, I'm not gonna give you advice on cultivating anything for to be edible, um, but the root is, is the part of the plant that's used for that. And you can, you know, if you dug up the wild ginger and you scrape its root and it smells exactly like any other kind of ginger. So um, wild ginger, good option. All right, a uh, giant swallowtail. Um, this guy, I debated whether or not to include it because they're not super common around here, but they do exist here in Indiana. Um, they are the largest butterfly that we have here in Eastern North America with a wingspan of up to seven inches across. I mean, that is a big butterfly, big butterfly. It's hard to do scale on a Zoom camera. Um, they have the swallow tail, the little tail on the end. This picture looks like this guy is missing a little bit on the one side. Mostly black with a yellow stripe on it. So kind of actually similar in color to the black swallow tail, but significantly bigger. Um, if, if you go to the south, southern, southeastern US, you know, we're talking Florida, Alabama, areas like that, you're going to see more of those, these guys. They prefer a lot of citrusy stuff. Um, so they're more common in the south where citrus grows, but we do occasionally get them here. Uh, the caterpillar. We have another one who is mimicking bird poop. Gotta love it. Good protection. I mean, that is a big piece of bird poop and most things aren't gonna wanna eat that. So if you wanted to plant a host for our giant swallowtail, you've got two options. A hop tree, which is what is pictured here. I see these occasionally in the forests here. Um, they are, they would be considered a small tree or may even depending on, you know, what field guide you're looking at might fall into the shrub category. They're not huge. Um, and they've got those, do you see the seed pods right there? Round, you know, if nothing else, even if you've never heard of hop tree, you've probably found those little dried out seed pods falling on the ground in the late summer, early fall. Um, Northern prickly ash is another one, but I'll be honest that that's not something that I've seen commonly. So, but I wanted to include this um, because the giant swallowtail is just a very impressive butterfly. And the last one that we're gonna cover today, the spice bush swallowtail. I think these guys kind of look like the black swallowtail. Um, and I'll go back a couple, doo, doo, doo. no, I missed him. Black swallowtail right there, but spice bush does not have any of that yellow. It's the black, blue, and white. Um, their caterpillar is like the tiger swallowtail, really just looks like a cartoon character. Um, in fact, if you've got kids that are into Pokemon, there is a Pokemon that looks almost exactly like this guy. Um, I assume it was based on this, but I want to include Spicebush Swallowtail because man, if you are looking for a good, very wildlife beneficial plant to put out in your yard, Spicebush is it. They will also host on sassafras, um, which is another great native, smaller to medium-sized tree. Spice bush, though, um, I'd say 10 to 12 feet tall. It can bush out like you see in the picture there. Um, that The yellow leaves that you see is what it does in the fall. It's generally green throughout the year. It gets those red berries on it. And in early spring, it flowers like what you see on the right side. Spice bush is beautiful. 
Uh, the flowers are beneficial for a lot of things. Birds love the berries on it. Um, if you've been ripping out um, a mirror honeysuckle, bush sun honeysuckle, which is an invasive, and you're looking for something to replace it with, a spice bush would be an awesome thing to put there um, and would be host plant for this. Other benefit is spice bush, um, other than it being beautiful, great understory plant or good shrub to put on a, you know, the edge of your property or even, you know, out front of your house. Um, is it's deer resistant. Deer don't like it. If you break up the leaves, it has a very lemony smell and a lot of things don't like to eat that. So, you know, <laughs> for a lot of us, getting something that the deer aren't just gonna decimate is a great option. So that is your spice bush um, swallowtail and it's host plant, as you may imagine, spice bush. So you can see some of these actually got named after their host plant. That's how specific they are. So. That is crash course of 16 fairly common butterflies and their host plants with one exception, the endangered Baltimore tiger spot, but has a great host plant that we can work on planning to try to bring it back. Um, so where do we get the plants? That's usually a big question of where do we find these things? Um, so you may wanna screenshot this, this slide right here or write these down and, or you can, you know, contact me through um, the Facebook page or um, my email if you're on the Zoom call and I can send you some of these. There are, this is not an all-inclusive list. There are other places in central Indiana to buy native plants. Um, I tried to use some of the ones that we're most familiar with, um, but for all of these, a lot of it's seasonal, so you may want to give them a call, say, what do you guys have going on? What, what do you still have in stock? Especially if you're looking for something specific. And if there's a specific plant, maybe one you've learned about today that you're interested in, even if these places don't have them in stock, they may be able to direct you to somebody that does or let you know like, oh, you should order that in the fall. Like trees are generally a fall order. The wildflowers are spring. So right now in summer, you know, it's June 1st, we're kind of in the middle. You might be able to get some seeds going um, or look into next year um, or start planning in the fall for next year. Um, so Native Plants Unlimited, they operate out of a, um, out of Geist Nursery, Fisher's area. Um, they do a few big public sales. They do pre-orders. They're awesome. They have a lot of stuff to select from. I'm not sure what they still have left. I know their public sale has been going on. Um, so that's worth contacting. They also have social media pages that you can reach out to or, or watch. Um, and they post, you know, when they're doing pre-orders and things like that. Um, Woody Warehouse, which is in Lizton. So if you're in central Indiana, it's not far. It's like West of Indianapolis, off of 74, not too far um, from here in Zionsville. It's, you know, maybe a 30 minute drive, a little less. Um, and that is where I send anybody that's looking for a specific tree or shrub. If you can't find it locally, talk to Woody Warehouse. They grow a lot of native trees and shrubs for the entire state of Indiana. They're awesome. They don't have like a nursery you can just walk into any day, any time. You've got a place pre-order, um, but they have a catalog on their website that you can look through if you're looking for something. And they often sell their trees in different sizes for different prices, right? So if you want to get a tree and it's a slow growing cherry tree, you know, it may be worth it to you to invest a little bit more money to get something that's older and already larger. So, you know, a lot of factors to consider there, but Woody Warehouse is absolutely the go-to for trees and shrubs. Um, Indie Urban Acres hosts a native plant sale. They had it just recently at Holiday Park in Indianapolis. Um, they're one to contact. I'm not sure where else. Um, dropping down just below that, Cool Creek Nature Center, which is in Carmel, right on the Carmel-Westfield border. They're part of Hamilton County Parks. They have plants for sale. Um, again, limited dates. I do believe they still have some in stock, but they're a good place to contact and talk to. Um, and I believe a lot of their stuff comes through the Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District. What a long name. Um, yearly, a lot of soil and water conservation districts throughout the state will do native plant sales, whether it's, you know, your wildflowers and other plants in the spring and then trees in the fall. So contacting your local soil and water conservation district is another really good option. Um, here in Boone County, I 
do not believe we have any kind of public sales through our conservation district as of now, but Hamilton County next door to us does. So they are worth calling and talking to. Um, Prairie Moon Nursery is online. Um, they are based out of Wisconsin, but when I'm looking for seeds specifically, I go to them. I've never ordered live plants through them, but I know people who have, and you can have them shipped directly. Um, but for seed, that's a good, good resource. Prairie Moon Nursery, they'll send you a seed catalog if you ask for it. They've got a lot of great options. You can get seed mixes too. So if you're looking to maybe transition a section of your yard into a wildflower meadow, or you know, you've removed a bunch of winter creeper from your forest floor and you wanna add some natives, you can get you know a mix that is a little easier to just put out rather than planting individual ones though so, um you know planting from seed versus planting sprouts is different so it just depends on what your goals are and then we have cardno um, which is located in walkerton indiana up north near south bend um, but they are an awesome resource the whole state you know lots of park districts use them contract them for some of our plantings reforestation efforts um, they have seeds they have plants online wholesale they're generally not for the like individual, I want one little bush type buyer, but if you're looking to do some larger scale work, they are a great option to consider um, looking at. Um, additionally, we have the Indiana Native Plant Society is a great resource to get involved with, follow their social media pages, join the Indiana Native Plant Societies, go to their meetings. Um, they often do a sale once a year. And they can also, you know, provide some good education. Um, and I am also going to include this link in the comments and the chat. But coming up here in um, two weeks on June fourteenth, we here at the Zionsville Parks and Recreation Department are going to be hosting a um, Indiana Wildlife Federation Certified Wildlife Habitat Workshop. So. Um, somebody from the Wildlife Federation is going to come do a talk at the Zionsville Nature Center um, on how to get your yard certified as a certified wildlife habitat. Um, so not just butterflies, it, but all sorts of things. And it's a great resource that you could come check out. It is an in-person at the Nature Center workshop that you'd have to sign up for. I just put the link in the chat in the Zoom. I will add it in the comments on Facebook as well. Um, and, you know, hopefully you could sign up for that and join us for a meeting. So I hope everybody learned a little bit. Thanks for taking an hour out of your day to learn a little bit about common butterflies and their host plants. Um, if you have questions, feel free to leave them and I will get to them as soon as I can. You guys are awesome. Happy gardening. Hope you see some good butterflies. Take care, everyone.